You're listening to the Gloves Off podcast, powered by IE Sports Radio, the show that brings you raw boxing debate, with your host, Marcus Los Great. <laughs> What's good, fight fans? It's your boy, Marcus Los Great, here to give you what you want. Here to give you what you need. Yeah, man. Yeah. (laughs) Got a great show planned for you guys tonight. Let's get this thing popping. Let's get it popping. Welcome, 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 welcome to the Gloves Off podcast, powered by IE Sports Radio, your first, your last, your everything and all that is combat sports, IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for for, for all that is sports. Hope you guys had a good weekend. I had a great weekend watching the return, the return of the King Chocolate Tito. I don't. I, that was uh, one of the fights that stole the weekend. This weekend was Chocolate Tito. I hope you guys got to check that out. We got to see Mikey Garcia in his second fight at 147. Uh, We got to hear a lot more of the Wilder excuses. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? It's got to keep us entertained for the week. (laughs) And then um, this weekend, as we prepare for, um, you know, Style Bender to have his fight in the UFC, taking our uh, Romero, you know, that's going to be a great fight. Um, the card itself isn't that strong of a card, but um, the fact that they're giving you Style Bender versus Romero in a um, you know on a card that that is pay per view worthy in itself. You know that fight itself is pay per view worthy. So um, as you know, we got a few bills to pay, so let's get to it. All thoughts and opinions. Of the Gloves All Boxing Podcast are the thoughts of my own and in no way, shape, or form represent the thoughts and opinions of IE Sports Radio. We are coming to you live from your mama's basement. You know what I'm saying? In a crispy, crispy white tea. (laughs) You know how we do it. You know how we do it. (laughs) What a weekend. What a weekend. You know, um, let's start off the weekend, um, start off uh, by recapping the Mikey Garcia fight. Um, You know, there wasn't too much controversy in what happened with that. You know what I'm saying? Um, Mikey Garcia, you know, basically did his thing, you know, taking, um, you know, Vargas and, um, you know, basically 
just um, putting the, or applying the pressure to him and then um, after he applied the pressure to him um, made him feel his power you know that's a, you know we, we 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 can't ask for more from Mikey Garcia from what he did this weekend um, he put Vargas down you know he hurt him multiple times in the fight that's what you asked for what's up to you Davidson Crooks shout out to um, you know you and your show um, you guys um, basically do basketball on IE Sports Radio you know I definitely check you guys out from time to time it's a beautiful thing <laughs> um, yeah I felt like Mikey Garcia did his thing this weekend did anything that Mikey Garcia do this weekend change our opinions about him at 147? My answer to that is no. Nothing Mikey Garcia did this weekend changed my opinion that he shouldn't be fighting above 140 pounds. Um, in the fight with Vargas, he got hit. You know what I'm saying? Um, he got hit more than he normally gets it. And um, you've seen it on his face after the fight. And um, if Vargas had just a tiny bit more power, um, I think that changes the out the outset of that fight. I think um, Mikey Garcia doesn't win this Saturday if Vargas has just a little bit more power. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, Davidson, you know what I'm saying? Um, this uh, March Madness is definitely coming on up. My Dukies, you know what I'm saying? I think we're going to take it all this year. I think we're going to take it all this year. You know what I'm saying? We got handled a couple of times this year that, um, you know, we need those. We needed those um, losses that we got this year. You know what I'm saying? So, um, but I think we're ready. I think we're gonna end up uh, coming in as a two seed, and I think that's gonna lead us all the way to the turning. You know what I'm saying? I can't wait for March Madness. You know, normally what I do um, during March Madness is I take those two weeks off just so I can watch nothing but the games. You know what I'm saying? But um, this. Uh, March Madness, um, me and my wife were actually celebrating our 20th year anniversary. So um, we're going to actually um, go on a cruise, um, you know, starting this Saturday. So I won't be able to take off um, time for March Madness, but I can't wait for March Madness. That is one of the biggest sports events of the year that I think everyone pays attention to. No matter what sport you're into, you pay attention to March Madness. Hey, what's up, Taryn? Um, sorry I didn't get to check into your show today, man. Um, like I said, I'm getting ready um, for me and the wife to go on a cruise, man. So uh, my time has been limited. I didn't get to check you out last week, and I didn't get to check you out this week, man. My apologies, bro, because, uh, you know, I like to check into your show and, and chat GCU, GCU. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, yeah, uh, me and the wife, we're going on a cruise. We're going to uh, Mexico. We're going to be chilling down there for about five days. And then um, we're going to basically head to um, Santa um, Barbara and um and chill out there for a couple more days and um then we'll come back and um get back to business you know what i'm saying during that time my show uh won't won't be playing next tuesday um so i'll definitely um miss everyone then but um we'll definitely be back to tuesday after that you know what i'm saying straight talking this boxing doing what we do in all combat sports you know what i'm saying <laughs> um yeah, so um, Mikey Garcia, you know, um, you know, he fought uh, Vargas this this weekend, and um, with him fighting Vargas, he wanted to show everyone that he could handle um, it at the one hundred forty seven pound division. Um, the problem is uh, for Mikey is that Mikey is undersized. 
and um, his frame can only take so much. So when he's coming up to this upper weight, you know, he has to get a little bit more pudgier in order to do that. He's trying to do it with muscle and whatnot, but his frame really can't handle um, being at the 147 pound division. One of the reasons why Pacquiao is able to do it is because of Pacquiao's power. And Mikey does have pop, but he doesn't have the same type of power that Manny Pacquiao has. So, um, you know, basically that's going to be a hindrance to him if he chooses to stay at this division. Because if you're a smaller guy, uh, such as like Floyd Mayweather, such as a Manny Pacquiao, you're going to have to have some pop to keep these bigger guys off you. If you don't have no pop, they're going to be all over you um, as soon as the bell rings. You know what I'm saying? So I think that's one of the things um, this weekend truly showed is that um, even though that Marky, Mikey Garcia has pop, I, I don't think he has the level of pop that is required for him to fight at this um, at this weight. You know, so I think he's going to continue to have problems. Um, he's right now looking to land the Pacquiao fight. That's a beautiful fight for him. Uh, both him and Manny Pacquiao um, are about the same size. Um, Manny Pacquiao is uh, one of the smaller uh, welterweights. And um, it would be a great fight. It would be pay-per-view uh, worthy. Um because basically, uh, Mikey Garcia has the Latino fan base. Uh, Manny Pacquiao is a mainstream fighter. He's a household name that everyone knows. And um, that will do pay-per-view buys. I can easily see that fight doing about 600 to 800K buys. And with neither, neither fighter attached to a promoter it's not like they have to bring two networks together to make the fight happen this this is a fight that definitely can be made it's definitely a pay-per-view worthy type of fight and it's a fight that um all people would watch um it's a fight that um basically uh, that will cross over into the mainstream i think that's the main thing that boxing is running into an issue with and to a degree, I think um, USC is running into that same issue is that they just don't have that many crossover type of personalities or that many crossover type fighters that people care about. Um, yeah, you and me care about these guys because, it's, you know, we're boxing fanatics. You know what I'm saying? We're boxing nerds. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but. Uh -huh. Joe Blow at work, you know, who goes to the water cooler, he doesn't even know who these guys are. You know what I'm saying? He, he could care less about seeing the fight because basically he doesn't know who they are. But when you bring up a guy like Manny Pacquiao, Joe Blow knew, knows who Manny Pacquiao is. Um, Joe Blow knows who Floyd Mayweather is. Joe Blow knows who Conor McGregor is. Outside of those three names... You know, it's hard for mainstream guys um, to know who these guys are. And I think part of that is due to fighters not fighting enough. You know, we, you got guys like Gary Russell Jr. only fighting once a year. You can't do that, bro. I need you fighting three to four times a year, minimum. Minimum. You know what I'm saying? Guys like Gary Russell Jr. who are young, you know, you're barely establishing a name into this game. You have to fight three to four times a year for you to establish uh, a name in this business. If you're not doing that, I don't understand what you're doing in this industry. Because basically, it's more than the best fighting the best. Yeah, that plays a role into it, but I mean, it's like a small part of the equation. Um, the bigger part of the equation is being active. 
a bigger part of the equation is getting people in your area to know who you are. That's one thing I will say that top rank is doing well with Terrence Crawford. In Nebraska, they know who Terrence Crawford is. Everyone knows who Terrence Crawford is. He's a regional fighter before he became, you know, basically trying to be a Vegas fighter. Now, he's still in the process of trying to be a Vegas fighter, but for the most part, that dude is a regional fighter, and that dude can sell out events in his hometown. You other guys can't even sell out an event in your own hometown. You know what I'm saying? You can't even sell out. You can't even sell out in your own city. I mean, no one in your city knows you. What? What's what's going on with that? <laughs> you got to lock down your city before you come to Vegas. At the bare minimum, you got to lock down your city. Like Tank Davis. Tank Davis shuts down Baltimore. You know what I'm saying? Everybody in the B-Town knows who Tank Davis is. You know what I'm saying? Tank Davis went over and fought in Atlanta, which is across the pond. Basically, everyone in Atlanta knows who Tank Davis is. Now he's starting to cross over to Vegas. You, A lot of you guys is just fighting, man, and um, you you use this mantra of you want to fight the best. That's cool and everything. I support that 100%. I definitely support the best fighting the best. But at the same time, this is a business, bro. And if you are, if you cannot even sell out your hometown, how in the hell can you create a pay-per-view event in Vegas? How the hell can we make money? I'm not fighting you if you can't make money. I have no reason to fight you. You know what I'm saying? Nobody even knows you. That reminds me of um, back in the day, there was a dude um, back when Floyd was coming up. His name was Vivian Harris. And this dude used to get on the internet. <laughs> this dude used to do interviews, uh, chastising Floyd Mayweather. And a lot of us, me included, was like, dude, you need to go handle that dude. <laughs> this dude is talking too much. But Floyd at the time... He knew more than us. He was like, man, this man can't even sell out his own state. Why would I fight him when he when nobody knows who he is? You know what I'm saying? And he fought Zab Judah instead. He fought, um, you know, um, Sugar Shane Mosley instead. And, you know, the rest is history. Now he is a pay-per-view um, attraction. But there was a time where we was like, man. Floyd, you got to go handle that business with Vivian Harris. Right to this day, no one know who Vivian Harris was. This dude at one point had a had a title division. I believe it was the IBF belt at that particular time. And he was talking cash money type shit to Floyd Mayweather. <laughs> I mean, going to his press conferences. <laughs> he was straight clowning. He was straight clowning. But the fact of the matter is, is because he never became a attraction. He ended up falling off. He ended up getting knocked out by, um, by um, some fighter that we don't know. And basically... Fell off the map. No one, no one talks about him to this day. No one even knows who Vivian Harris is. And that's what that's what a lot of you dudes are gonna become, man. If you if people don't know who you are, and you're calling out the best, the best ain't gonna want to fight you. If you don't got no name, you know what I'm saying. So what's next for Mikey Garcia at 147? You know what I'm saying. What's next for him? Um. I think the next uh, thing that happens for him is he ends up fighting uh, Manny Pacquiao. I think he ends up getting that Pacquiao fight. If he can win the Manny Pacquiao fight, that is a game changer because he already has the Latino backing him right now where his events are selling out in Texas. He's basically um, able to put 10,000 uh, butts into an arena. At that particular time, I think that um, 
You know, basically he becomes a draw. And he can either go down to 140 and fight guys like Lomachenko and Tank Davis. Or he can stay at 47 and he can fight guys like Terrence Crawford. He already fought Spence and lost. That might open up a, another fight for a rematch. I honestly don't want to see it just because I've always thought that Spence is just too big for Mikey Garcia. Spence is a dog and he would eat Mikey alive. And when that fight happened, that is exactly what happened. Mikey was food for Earl Spence. <laughs> It was food, and he got ate alive. <laughs> you don't mess with the big dog. <laughs> He's just waiting on you guys, on you little champions to come on up, thinking you can come into the yard, and he eats you alive. You know what I'm saying? The only little dog that I think can probably handle or probably go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him is Terrence Crawford. And Crawford's got to raise his profile before he gets in there with Spence. Right now, I don't see how Crawford is going to raise his profile because basically top rank doesn't have the fighters he needs to raise his profile with. Uh, maybe if they can get, um, you know, basically um, Garcia to fight Terrence Crawford, that will allow Crawford to raise his profile. If Crawford can get Ugas in the ring, that will raise his profile. Um, if Crawford can get uh, Kell Brook in the ring, that's another fight that will raise his profile. He needs more fights so he can raise his profile. And um, then we're going to have us a grand time at 147. If we can get Spence and Terrence Crawford, you know, at the same level in a ring, that's the creme de la creme right there, gentlemen. You know what I'm saying? That's that top level fights that we're talking about. You know what I'm saying? You'll have half of the nation split in half. Half of the nation will be cheering on Errol Spence. The other half will be cheering on Terrence Crawford. And the two of them going to the ring to settle the 147 pound division for all the marbles, all the belts, everything. That is what we watch fights for. That is exactly what we watch fights for. I can't wait until it happens. I can't wait until it happens. Again, um, this weekend we also had Chocolatito. Chocolatito return, returned to the ring. Um, he fought for a belt. And he ended up knocking out his opponent. Um, basically, he put the division on notice. It was for the um, 115 pound division. Um, so basically, you put the, the division on notice that um, Chocolatito is back. Um, you know, I don't know. If he has what it takes to maintain his status. Uh, for me. I'm going to be honest. Before this fight I thought Chocolatito was going to lose. Um, I actually uh, picked against him. And um, he ended up knocking out the champion for the title. Um, for me Chocolatito is a guy. Um that I feel has competed at weight divisions where he's been basically the bigger guy. He got to a point where he became too big for those divisions and he had in weight pushed him out of those divisions. And now he's fighting at his natural weight and he hasn't looked as dominant as he has at the lower weights. Because of that, um, because of that, I, I'm not too confident in what Chocolatito is going to be able to do going forward. 
He has the tools to do it. I'm not saying he doesn't have the tools. The problem is, is that the level of competition. No, no, no. Take that back. Take that back. The problem is, is that at this weight class, he doesn't have the level of pop that he did at the under at the um, smaller weights. He can't bully these dudes like he bullies, um, you know, the guys at the smaller weights. And I think that is going to run its course. It ran its course before he was beaten um, before and then he was knocked out in that fight. Um, and basically he hasn't had the level of dominance at this weight as he has at the smaller weights. Some people say it's due to the fact that he lost his trainer. Um, you know, that definitely, you know, that definitely, that's not a, a bad excuse. You know, that's not a bad excuse at all. Um, that's definitely something to take into account. Um, but I don't think that you can just say it was due to that. Um, I think that, you know, I think that these guys can handle his power a lot better than the previous guys. And I think it's going to be harder to take these guys out. Um, just like this weekend against Khalid, um, you know, it took him, what, seven rounds, eight rounds to take him out of there. Um, if you look at his fights previously before, he was, you know, destroying guys like Brian Valora, you know, knocking him out in three rounds. Omar Salido knocking him out in two rounds. Um, Manuel Jimenez knocked him out in two rounds. You know, he at the at the light, you know, basically at the, um, you know, at light fly, he was dominant because, like I said, he was bigger than these guys. He was not only bigger than these guys, he is a heavy handed puncher. So you got the combination of being a heavy handed puncher and you're also being and you're also bigger than your competition. It's going to lead to devastation in the ring. And that's the reason why people started following him. You know, it's one of the reasons why he showed up on my radar. I was like, who is this guy? Roman Chocolate Cheeto, you know, this guy that they're basically trying to give the the crown that Floyd left that now they're trying to make him number one pound for pound. Who is this guy? You know, who is this guy, Roman Chocolate Cheeto? So I started watching his fights. He used to fight on the undercard of um, a Triple G, you know, basically. And that's how I started watching a lot of his fights is that I, uh, Triple G was coming on at that particular time. Um, Triple G was basically murdering everyone in the middleweight division. And, um, you know, basically both these guys were basically doing their thing. They were building their names together. So um, I started, you know, taking notice. You know, some people swear that he is the next coming of Julio Cesar Chavez. You know, as great as Julio Cesar Chavez was, you know, basically he was never truly, you know, great in one area. He was just a guy who was good and excellent. And, um... Because he was good and excellent, he excelled. The guy almost went 100 fights without losing. He almost went 100 fights without losing. That's the legend of Julio Cesar Chavez. And here they are trying to compare Roman Chocolatito to Cesar Chavez, who only has 49 fights. 
you know, 49 fights, two KOs. I mean, two losses, 49 fights, 49 wins, two losses. So he's had a total of 51 fights. You know, so he's already lost his first two fights before he even gotten to his 50th fight. You know, so I didn't believe the hype. You know, so I hope the kid um, can maintain his status and uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. You know what I'm saying? We'll see if he can keep it going. We'll see if he can um, not only get this he, because he, he captured the title this weekend. Hopefully he can grab the other um, belts at Superfly. I mean, yeah, it, I believe it's yeah Superfly. But she got the WBA. So he'll have an opportunity to fight for the WBC, the WBO, and also the IBF. Nice, nice, yeah, nice. But this weekend is going to be a UFC weekend. This weekend is going to be a UFC weekend in boxing. We have um, Adam Knauch. Uh, that's not how you say it. Adam Kananchi. <laughs> Adam Kananchi uh, fighting. And he's fighting uh, Robert Hel Hellenis, uh, which he should end up winning that fight. Um, it's going to be a heavyweight fight. So it should end. I'd say um, that fight ends in like four rounds. And I think Adam takes that fight. But, um, you know, other than that, there's not really much going on in boxing this weekend. Um, the, the, the noise is going to be for Stylebender and, um, and Romeo. You know, Stylebender. Where are they fighting at? Yep, UFC 248. Romeo. Yeah, you're going to have um, Style Bender versus um, Romeo. And this is going to be a toe to toe, blow for blow, um, fast paced, um, just kick ass type of fight. This is going to prove to a lot of people if Style Bender can go out and pull this off. You know, basically, what level this kid is at. Because this kid has been doing a lot of talking. You know, calling out the great John Jones. When you call out the great John Jones, you better be on your P's and Q's, sir. You better be on your P's and Q's. And Stal Bender has been on his P's and Q's. You know what I'm saying? He, um, the kid is basically fighting everyone who's anyone in a division. Um, I have no complaints. I have no complaints about Israel. Israel has done what we ask, you know, what we ask. We ask for you to fight the best. We ask for you to become a champion. And when you become a champion to hold yourself to a standard that you fight the best. And he's done nothing but fight the best. 
He's done nothing but fight the best. So if you get a chance this weekend, I definitely suggest that you watch the fight between Style, um, uh, Style Bender and also Giro Romero. That is going to be a top tier fight. Uh, that's definitely going to be a fight that I believe is going to go to the scorecards. It could end in knockout. I wouldn't be surprised if um, Style Bender can't KO um, UL. But I know UL is tough. 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 I'm telling you, man. This man, in some people's eyes, should be the champion of the division uh, due to his um, tough fight with Griffin. But this kid. Well, I can't, I can't say Yoel is a kid. <laughs> Dude is pushing like 45 years old, 50 years old. And he just and he's just a beast. He's a beast. And for Style Bender to call up Dana White and to be like, look, I know Yoel is a beast, but I want to fight him. I need to fight him for my legacy. If I don't fight him, then I won't have the respect of the people. That tells us what type of character this kid has. This kid is made of the things that we all want champions to be made of. The, the stuff that Sugar Ray Leonard was made of. The stuff that Tommy Hearns was made of. Basically, when you're in your youth... You want to fight the best. You want to see how truly good you are. And if you lose in the process, so be it. Because you want to be great. You know what I'm saying? You want to be great. You want to be great so bad that you're willing to lose. I can't wait to see the fight. I think it's going to, like I said, I think it's going to go all five rounds. I think... Um, I think it's going to be a back and forth type of fight. I think there's going to be spots where um, Style Bender is going to be dominant. I think there's going to be spots where um, Yoel is going to, um, you know, be dominant in his own right. But I think Style Bender pulls it out in the end. And I think he ends up winning the fight four rounds to one. You know, I think he pulls out the fight and he wins it four to one. Um, he's not going to leave this fight unscathed. And um, that's one thing I will say about this kid. This kid has been in those wars. He's fought in, fought in those hardened, tested type champions. And he's been in wars where he's had to dig deep and... Um, He's pulled it out. So I, I see nothing different happening this weekend. I feel that he's going to pull it out and he's going to win. You know what I'm saying? Also fighting on the card is going to be uh, women. Um, you're going to have Joanna. She's going to be fighting. Um, and I don't know how to pronounce her name, but she is a badass. She's from China. And she's a machine. She just comes forward. She throws shots. Um, she's young. Joanna's been champion in W. I mean, not W. Um, in UFC for a long time. She ended up losing her title. Um, and she's trying to make her way back. And um, Joanna was a dominant champion. Um, there, at one point in time... I had her as the number two um, woman in uh, mixed martial arts. Um, you know, and basically she's taken a couple steps back um, due to some things outside of the ring. You know, it happens to the best of them. 
You know what I'm saying? It happens to the best of them. But now she's back. Now she claims that she's got all those things taken care of. And she's ready to get back to doing what she does, which is kicking ass and taking names. You know what I'm saying? So she says she's back. And the first thing she's doing when she comes back is she's taking on this young stallion of a fighter. And um, she wants to prove that she's back. If she can pull it off this weekend, um, I would definitely be one of those people that says that saying that that would be saying she's back. If she can do it against Wayne, she oh, I would I would say you know next step would be to put her back in for for a championship rematch. I would say I would say to do that. But she's going to have to win this fight this weekend. And it's going to be a drag out war for five rounds. Is it five rounds or is it three rounds? Let me check on that real quick. Because she's no longer champion. So because she's no longer champion, it may be a, just a three round fight. Let me see. It is. It's for five rounds, man. For five rounds. Ah. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm not. I'm not reneging on my choice. I'm not reneging on my choice. If Joanna can pull it off this weekend, I say give her a title shot. But she's going to have to go through uh, Wayne. And I don't think she can. Uh, this. I just think that um, she's just too much of a machine. The pace that she's going to put on her is going to be too much. I think she's going to start fading. I think Joanna is going to start fading around the third round, third or fourth round. And um, it could lead to a KO by f by fifth or a submission by the fifth. Um, that's going to be my pick. You guys are making me question if I should change my pick to Joanna. You know, I definitely was thinking about it, but no, I kind of roll with my dog. Um, I think she, um, I think Wang pulls it out and... Um, I think next we'll hear um, or see Joanna retire, which will be a shame because she's given a lot to mixed martial arts. She was a dominant champion for a very long time. You know, outside of um, Ronda Rousey, she was the face of women's um mixed martial arts and the MMA. And then when the rise of Amanda Nunez came up and Cyborg, um, and then they had their fight, um, you know, she kind of took a step back. But, you know, Joanna had her place at the table. She was very dominant as a champion, and she deserves her respect. If you go out this weekend, Joanna, you know, salute to you. You've given us a lot of fights. You've given us reason to cheer. You've given us wars. You've given us blood. You've given us guts. And we appreciate it. The fans appreciate it. So if you go out this weekend, go out in style. Go out in style. Go out on your shield. And, you know, we wish you the best. We truly wish you the best because you've done nothing but give us the best of you. We definitely appreciate it. Also this weekend on that same card um, for UFC um, 248 is going to be 
Darrus versus Clues. Clues is supposed to be um, on the up uprise. So, um, you know, I think um, he should, I think he's going to be able to get past Darrush. Um, yeah, I don't think, I don't think he should have any problems with that. Um, there's also going to be a couple other guys on the card. But, um, yeah, Brunson is going to be fighting a, a kid, um, Edmund, um, who's 11 and 0. I think that, um, Brunson is going to end up upsetting the kid. Too much experience. That's so what, that's one of the things that happened to a lot of these kids in you and UFC mixed martial arts. Uh, Bellator is they end up matching them against these older guys and it's not like boxing boxing is a young man sport you put an old man in there with a young man and nine times out of the ten the young man is going to win there are a few cases where the old man you know reaches back into his bag of tricks and um, basically puts it on the young man but that doesn't happen very often in the UFC. In the UFC, when they put a lot of these young guys in here with these older men, these older men beat these younger men because they just know the game. You know what I'm saying? So it just happens. It just happens. Another thing that we've been noticing um, that's just happening <laughs> in the world of boxing right now is um, the wilder excuses, man. You know, I said last week that I wasn't going to touch it because um, anyone that's been watching, um, you know, boxing or MMA, you know that these guys to um, get to the level of champion and um you know guys that get to the level of legend and and things of that nature these guys have egos so for them to lose they have to believe that there's something outside um of themselves that created the loss you know while they're so far has blamed camp he's blamed his leg he said furry didn't hurt him he ended up blaming the trainer listening to outside forces and then the the craziest excuse was him blaming his costume <laughs> bruh don't do this to yourself man <laughs> and as embarrassing as it is, the problem is, is that the, you know, like I said before, when you get to a certain level in this game, you get an ego and these guys can't handle losing. It's not just Wilder. Muhammad Ali himself, the greatest, made an excuse why Joe Frazier beat him. He blamed the judges. He said they were on the payroll. And then when he won the second fight, they asked him, well, do you still have a problem with the judges? And he, he sat there and laughed for a minute. He thought to himself, well, it's the same judges, you know what I'm saying? So even he recognized the silliness in it. But when you're, when, well, that's one of the problems that I have with the in-ring interview um, after you've lost, um, you know, a fight. Is that your blood is a drink? Your blood is pumping. You're you're bound to say something that you don't that you truly don't want to say. You're just saying it because you're you're in the moment. And I think that they should have allowed Wilder some time away. I I don't think Wilder should be, you know, making excuses for for you know what happened. He came out to fight in the first two rounds. You know what I'm saying? I felt that he won both rounds. Some people feel that he only won the second round. Whatever. 
you know, and then he ended up getting knocked down in the third, which I believe was a rabbit punch. Now, even though it is a rabbit punch, that is considered a legal shot unless deemed illegal by the referee. The referee said it was legal, so it's legal. And he lost. So now what he needs to do is go back to the drawing board and make some adjustments. The problem is that I think he's running it. He's going to run into especially preparing for a third fight that's supposed to happen in July is that the people that he have in his corner don't know how to make adjustments. They, they, they just don't know how to make an adjustment. They've basically been living off of his right hand this entire time, which is okay because, I mean, he's got superhuman type power in that right hand. And he can close the show with that right hand. The problem is, is that you can't, at this level of the game, there are going to be some fighters that you're not going to be able to take out with just that right hand. And that's one of the things that he ran into against Tyson Fury. You know, so they're going to need to, I think he's going to need to um, get rid of hit one of his trainers or he can bring in another voice uh, to help him during training camp. One of those people that I suggest that he brings in to help him would be Sugar Shane Mosley. Sugar Shane Mosley has a history of working with teams that are already in place and he will be able to give you some tools that will help you be successful in the ring. You know what I'm saying? So I think that's something that he should take advantage of. I definitely think that that's something that he takes advantage of. But gentlemen, that's my time. Like I said, I won't be here uh, next Tuesday. I'll be on a cruise I'm celebrating my 20th year anniversary of marriage to my wife. You know, we'll be in Mexico. You know, I have on my vacation hat with my cigar <laughs> blowing smoke into the ocean. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> You know, I have um, my Hawaiian shirt on with my chest hair out, <laughs> you know, catching in them sun rays uh, from Mexico. And then uh, we're going to go to California and we're going to enjoy ourselves there. But as soon as we're done enjoying our time in the sun, I will be back. I will be back here talking boxing. You know what I'm saying? We're just going to take a slight hiatus for one week and then your boy will be back. Trust me when I say your boy will be back on the mic talking that boxing, talking, talking that combat sports, doing what we do, fight fans, doing what we do. So I'm out. I'm on to the next one. Sayonara. <laughs>